20 years ago, I met Tim, the owner of a huge office building downtown. It was a strange adventure in my life. Businessmen were bored, having invented a tradition of staging crazy social experiments. They pretended to be lower class people. One day I was walking from school and saw a poorly dressed man lying in the snow on cardboard. The picture shook me to the core. With tears I took off my old fur coat and covered the uncle, barely audibly whispering that he needed it more. At home my mother gave me a scandal, calling me a childish fool and threatening to give me to a shelter for the homeless. I cried and could not understand why helping the suffering is considered a bad thing. And the next morning an expensive Mercedes drove up to the house, from which the same uncle got out, so handsome and dazzling, in a stylish business suit. He brought us a mink coat for me and mom. May, if it's hard, call me, I'll always be here for you. And here's another present he handed me a box. You can open it when you come of age. After graduating from high school, I opened the cherished gift. It was the keys to the apartment. By the way, I never forgave my mother for those cruel words about the orphanage. I went to college and moved out. But Tim and I are still friends. He used to tell me funny stories about his time as a homeless man. It wasn't very funny. It was the cruelty of the people. A little girl standing alone on the threshold of goodness in the world. That's what Tim told me. I loved him, but our relationship didn't go beyond friendship. One day he was driving me to the university where I was already working as a teacher. It was bloody foggy. You can hardly see the road. Tim grumbled. Do you want me to drive? Yes, you do. I wouldn't even trust you with a donkey. Hey, what's the big deal? With your violent temper you might scare people. What the hell? What's he doing? I yelled when I saw a car swerving into the oncoming traffic. We had to swerve to the right to dodge. The car skidded. Brakes screech. The car flipped over. I opened my eyes. It was an accident. Tim on the wheel, the car on its side. I reached for him, but the belt was in the way, and I jerked again. I needed to touch him now, to make sure he was okay. Tim. The belt wouldn't stretch. I tugged desperately at it. Tim, can you hear me? I unbuckled the belt, gently lifted the man's head. He was unconscious, but breathing as usual. There were cuts on his face from broken glass. I turned the keys, turned off the car engine. What's wrong with you? I gently began to feel his arms and legs, and he seemed fine. But when I touched his ribs, he groaned. Let's get out of the car. I need the phone. But where is it? I don't know how I got Tim out and onto the pavement. He didn't regain consciousness. I rushed to the car for the first aid kit. Then I turned around and screamed. There was a stranger standing next to the car. Blood was running down his face from a split eyebrow. Is he alive? He asked. It's all you. I could lose him because of you. Learn to ride, or better yet, get on a scooter. Tim groaned. I rushed over to him. Are you all right? My back hurts, he wheezed. Shh. Don't move, I said, choking back tears. Don't panic. I'll live. Gave him a quite meaningful answer, and I began to give first aid more deliberately. I think your ribs are broken. Let's take some painkillers. You don't know how scared I was, do you? It's because of some people. I looked at the speeder. He was sitting with a split eyebrow, leaning back against the car. I'll talk to him. You're staying here? Just go. I sternly approached the mountain of a driver. What's your name? In addition to his eyebrow, his head was also shattered. He backed away from me. The man in the car. What's wrong with him? He asked, keeping his eyes on me. His ribs seem to be broken. He's all right. Now I see what's wrong with your head. What is it? He asked indifferently. There's no brain in your head. May, it's all right. I heard Tim's voice over my head. Why did you get up? You need to lie down. I told you it's okay. What's your name? I asked the man who caused the accident. Alex. There are cuts on my head and they're pretty deep. I think I need stitches. The guy looked at me and caught every word. You're a doctor? Associate professor? PhD in history. And what does that mean? He asked it curiously. It means that I am a smart man. Yes, boy. You can rest assured that her heat is not a head, but a computer. It's so alive in there that it doesn't fit under any hat. How fascinating he muttered as he continued to stare at me. 
If you think I don't have a brain, don't half your brain for me. I looked at Alex uncomprehendingly. At such a terrible moment, he was also joking. Tim appreciated the humor and chuckled nervously. And I'll make the call. I can't rely on your marvelous discretion. I went back to the car with a pang, found the phones, and returned with them. Alas, my phone is hopelessly dead. Tim's phone is broken. What about your phone? I don't know. Let's look. I reached out and helped him up off the pavement. We didn't find the phone. Okay, then let's go to the hospital ourselves, since you're the least of my worries right now. I'll drive. No, Alex replied grimly. There was steel in his voice. He resolutely took the wheel himself. We managed to fit in the back seat. Why the hell did you swerve into the oncoming lane? Tim bellowed. Me, he said with difficulty. My wife left me. I just left, and I talked to her on the phone, and she said she'd met someone else and was leaving me, he said in a husky voice. My phone fell out. I bent over, and then there was a bang. He finished. I'm sorry, but all three of us ended up almost going to our great-grandfather's. I'm not there yet, but I can help you with that meeting, if that's what you want. May, don't say anything. Don't be poisonous, Tim asked. Okay but my conscience won't shut up. At the hospital, Tim got out of the car and we went inside. What kind of poverty is this? Tim burst out. After going through two doors, we finally came upon a lighted emergency room. A sleepy girl came out to meet us. We've been in an accident. We need help. I'm gonna call the doctor now. We were led into an office. One of the girls was tending to Tim and the other was looking at me. I had blood on my t-shirt. It's not my blood, I'm fine. Tim was found to have cracked ribs. Alex got a few stitches in his cuts. Then the insurance company was called and a report was filed. I was moved to a private room. As soon as my head touched the pillow, I fell asleep instantly. In the morning, they woke me up for breakfast. It was hard to wake up. My head didn't want to clear. My body ached. What's this? I pointed with squeamishness at the cup with sticky contents. Porridge. You can't last long on the stuff they feed the sick. I decided to eat a few spoonfuls and drink warm tea. Then I decided to visit Tim. He was in the same room as Alex. Hi, I'll come in. How are you? Tim rolled his eyes. Pretty much alive. How are you feeling? I turned to Alex as a courtesy. I'm fine. He hummed, hiding from my gaze. How are you doing? Tim gave me an expressive look. The cuts will heal, and it'll be fine. You and I are going to make a splash at work, though. Man, this is really bad timing. Wouldn't be the first time. Tim tried to put a smile on his face. Exactly, I sighed. Though at first I thought about how nice it would be to have a break from this hospital at home. Breakfast hinted to me that we weren't welcome here. You lie down and take care of your nerves, sweetheart. I'll figure out how to get out of here. Tim soon found a service station foreman who agreed to come to the hospital. What's wrong with the car? We're repairing it so we can move on, I replied. At first glance, it doesn't look too bad, said Oliver, the car mechanic, and ordered us to wait for three hours. Alex, I suggest we find a store and get something to eat. I think I'm going to starve to death. Let's go downtown, Tim commanded. He looked at me with a puzzled expression. In the center, we not only found stores, but also a coffee shop. I was overjoyed. Alex was mostly silent, being in heavy thoughts. The repairs dragged on for 24 hours. I once again waved my optimistic plans and wandered with Alex around this tiny godforsaken town under Alex's slightly surprised look and tried everything that was available after ice cream and chocolate. The gas station attendants were already looking at me slightly surprised. Alex paid for the repairs and we were given my car back, which even had windows put in. I followed Alex back to the hospital in my car. After thanking the doctor, I picked Tim up from his treatments and we were finally able to move on. He's a normal person, Tim said on the way. Yeah, he's good, he almost killed us. You're unlucky, I'm the only one. I'm the one who drives like a donkey. May, you seem smart, but sometimes you say such stupid things, don't you? Tim said angrily. And I love you. I smiled wryly, barely holding back my tears. I'm sorry, I meant to say that you're not like a normal woman. Tim, you've got some nerve. Enjoy what you have. Yes. I'm normal in my expression of emotion. What's wrong with my emotions? Yeah, that's it, get over it. 
I'm a simple man. I don't have that much health to argue with you. You see, knowing how to close your mouth in time guarantees a long and happy life. I smiled softly at him, to which he rolled his eyes. What a wonderful response, like a possum that sees danger and pretends to be dead. Sometimes I want to kill you, Tim groaned in annoyance, and I wondered what life is, perhaps a blank canvas where every day a new color appears. And color isn't always predictable. Maybe it's a hard road. Maybe life is a book, like a detective, like a novel, like a comic book. Soon I returned to my routine teaching job. I was comforted only by the memories of the accident and dark-eyed Alex, which stirred my blood. One day, a visitor burst into the office. Hello, I'm told you're the best of the best. I want to hire you. I'll pay you. Standing at my table was a man in his 40s, medium height, medium build, wearing a suit and with an insolent expression. In his slightly contemptuous look was the absolute firmness of the owner in his own superiority over the whole world. And though he started in a boorish manner, I saw intelligence and mockery in his eyes. For a moment I stared at him in silence. I was not interested. Thank you for the offer. I called your boss. He handed me the phone. May. I heard our rector's voice. Please. We owe Jack so much. Don't deny his request. Do I have any other options? May. Please. His company is one of our sponsors. It's very important that we keep it that way. Is that how you got me a star on my tree? I put Jack on the phone. Okay, Jack. I can't say I'm thrilled, but I guess I can't say no. He smiled arrogantly, and it clearly didn't add to my respect for him. It gave me goosebumps. There was something unhealthy about his good-natured smile like an old maniac. I'll tell you about it in a more private setting. Let's say tomorrow in my office. Look, Jack, I don't want to play games with you except rules I don't understand. I switched to the first name, not wanting to hold back any more animosity. I'll give that up, I hear you. But in the office we'll still be more comfortable. He interrupted me, and now he was no longer smirking. There was no trace of his simple-mindedness left. And the address and time? The man handed me a business card. Of course the office is in the center. How could it not be? I think tomorrow at 1900 would be convenient for you and me. Yes, goodbye. I'll wait for you. He's gone. Why should I be punished, I thought. There are all sorts of unpleasant people with delusions of grandeur who say they're hiring. That's how I want to wish these kings of life to go to the distant wanderings of the forest. With a doomed look, I turned back to the stack of students' notebooks. May, a student called out to me as I entered. What's William? Remember we were talking about my grandfather? Yes. I replied affectionately. Grandpa got maps of the old town, inviting you to visit him for the weekend. It's outside of town, though. Will you come? William, that's an incredible offer. Of course I'll come. Then I'll meet you Saturday, Ten Rock. Can you make it? Yes, okay. See you Saturday. He smiled happily and disappeared from the office. The next day I had to go to the office for a meeting. I looked quite ordinary dressed strictly and perhaps a little ridiculous on purpose. A suit, a bundle on my head, glasses on my nose. I looked like an elementary school teacher. I got to the office building surprisingly quickly. Do you have an appointment? Two security guards met me at the entrance. I took out my business card and put it on the desk. One of them started reading, and the other asked for a document. You're taking so long to read. You must be studying my entire biography and my family down to the seventh knee. We're doing our job. Down the hallway to the right and the elevator goes up to the seventh floor to the left and the end of the hall. Thank you. I went looking for the office, gritting my teeth. The call from Jack rang at 19 sharp. May, where are you? I'm taking the elevator. Your security is very meticulous. They're only meticulous if the customers don't like it. That's very kind of you, I said. In the office, a sense of unease swept over me. Jack, in his fancy suit and stylish glasses, looked menacing in his luxurious office. That must have been the plan. He invited me to sit down. Coffee? Tea? Thank you. Why don't you tell me why I'm here? I won't be original, but I demand that everything you hear be kept between us. Jack, of course, I can't promise you that. We're not a torny client privilege where secrecy is a prerequisite for trust. So, it's a good idea to figure out what to do next. He stared at me for several minutes. 
It made my hair stand on end. But I suppressed unnecessary emotion and held his gaze, like Hannibal's before dinner, just as unblinking, wary. I'm listening. I own a construction company. During the construction work, we found something. Jack stood up, picked up a very ordinary package from the floor, placed it on the table. I shifted my gaze from the package to Jack, who looked calm but tense. He carefully unwrapped the package. At first I was stunned. It was a plaster cast of a man's hand, like a stone. I took it and twirled it in my hands, attentive and mesmerized. What is it? Jack spoke up, bored with my visual study of the mummy. So where did you find it? I asked my question, completely ignoring him. During the construction of our office and warehouse space, he grimaced. So you know what it is? It's some kind of stone. A mummy of what appears to be a grown man's hand that became a stone. You mean fossilized? Is it some kind of old tragedy? Jack asked. I'm not a shaman. It takes equipment and time to study this interesting find, I muttered, completely absorbed in the new mystery. I'm glad you're interested, he continued sarcastically. Actually, I called you because we have a mystic in the warehouse. He grimaced. There are noises coming from the vents and people don't stay in our warehouse for long. We put up soundproofing but you can still hear the howling. And then we found this. He nodded at the hand in my hands. I bit my lip to keep from laughing. The howling, the hand, the fugitive laborers. Incredible story. So that was the important thing I needed to find out. A mischievous light jumped in my eyes, which my interlocutor took as an insult. Yes, he gritted his teeth. Okay, where is your warehouse? Lugavoy. I can be there by four wands on Wednesday. We'll deal with your spirits. I'm quite the ghost hunter. I couldn't help but giggle. On that optimistic note, I bowed out and giggling walked to the car with my bag clutched tightly in my hands. The first thing I did as soon as I got to the car was to call an acquaintance. Hello, doctor. Am I in heaven yet? I can hear your voice, May. The husky voice sounded playful. Doctor, I have a riddle for you. A puzzle with a hint of antiquity. Not a trivial biological substance that's inexplicably fossilized. I can tell from your excited voice that I need to see it. When can you get here? I can be at your office in an hour. Then I'll be waiting for you, angel of the earth. Bag in hand. I went to the lab, really hoping that no one would want to look in and ask uncomfortable questions. Now an old acquaintance of mine, Nicholas, PhD, worked in the Department of Criminology and Forensic Science. He wore a beard, a suit, was sarcastic, possessed a high intellect, and liked to drink. The doctor easily changed woman, cities, countries, jobs, hobbies, anything that could be changed. The hallway smelled like an old room with a touch of dampness odor. I walked quickly to the office, knock it and only then enter it. I said hello to him in Japanese, subtly alluding to his six-month stay in this country. Darling, why do I only love you? He smiled. For my beautiful soul? I asked. Your soul is really good, and your body is even better. He shamelessly pawed at me with his eyes bumping into my stern gaze. Come here, he commanded, seriously seeing the bag in his hands. Carefully he took his hand out, whistled, took it out, twirled it around and examined it. How interesting he muttered. Have you seen one of these before? I asked. Where did you get it from? We found it at a construction site when we were building a warehouse. Why don't I know anything about it? He raised an eyebrow in surprise. Who would talk about it? They are all so conscientious that at best they will bury them where they were taken. How did you find out yourself? Asked the doctor. They've got extraneous noises in the warehouse there now, out of nowhere. So a willful decision was made to share the find. So, Doc, could you tell me what this is? Doc shifted his gaze from his hand to me. Once I figure out what it is, it's a long time coming. I'll type it up. I was gently sent away. Exactly what I'd expected, used to the oddities of my acquaintance. So I bowed out and went home, thinking where to look for information about the place with mysterious sounds. I started from afar with the first mention of the village. In the 18th century, there was a weaving workshop here. The village lived, developed, changed, belonged to different people. In the second half of the 19th century, there was intensive industrial construction. And of course, there was a man-made disaster here, when a mud flow flooded Lugavoy and led to numerous victims. According to official information, 
More than 100 people died in the area of the accident. But historians say that the real number of victims at the moment cannot be established and call the figure of a thousand people. So part of the body remained undiscovered. The fact that the find could refer to those times was very likely. Hopefully the paper can determine why it looks this way and not the other, and what do we have? A place with a rich history and little information about the tragedy itself. On one forum I came across a somewhat gruesome description of those events. Actually, I didn't think much of the tragedy myself. Of course, I knew that it happened, but no more. And here are memories from the war. The bodies were dumped right into the ravine. Another assumption was that some authorities had decided to fill in the waste from the brickyards to create a flat topography. The dam did not meet the design parameters and safety standards which led to the disaster. I no longer had the energy to read about the tragedy. I took off my glasses, wiped my eyes tiredly. It must be very difficult to search for the truth when everyone has their own truth. On Saturday, I had a meeting with William's grandfather. I woke up and quickly got ready. A brown-eyed woman with wide black eyebrows and black hair looked back at me from the mirror. I took a bottle of dry wine and a cake with me and went to meet her. William showed himself to be at his best. He wasn't even late and was waiting for me. I stopped and waved him over. He quickly ran up to the car with a happy smile. Hi. Hi. So Harry, you ready to meet us? Yes, my grandfather is already cooking kebabs, cheerfully replied the boy. Do you visit your grandfather often? I asked. Almost every weekend. He raised me. And your father? My father started another family. He wasn't interested in the old one. He looked back at the road. There was bitterness in his tone. And how did you become interested in studying the underworld? I asked. I was 15 years old. A friend and I climbed into a tunnel. There was a pointless walk and ruined clothes. And then I became consciously interested in it. I started exploring the area, looking for maps, saving up money for my first piece of equipment. And I consciously went to learn. We need to go to the right. We're almost there, William said, keeping his eyes on the road. May, stop at the wrought iron gate. We're there. I parked the car, and William and I got out. It was beautiful here. There were huge pine trees growing all around and a nice smell of resin. I took a deep breath and stretched. It was nice here. Yes, it was once a fairly prosperous resort town. Let's go inside. I pulled out a bag of wine and a cake and followed William. The yard was small and neat. We saw a not-so-tall, frail and jolly old man with squinty eyebrows and a very genuine smile. William, hey, come here, he shouted and went back to his skewers, which gave off a heady aroma. Hello? I said hello to him. Welcome. The man smiled. May, this is my grandfather Harry. In one breath William blurted out, May, said I, it's nice to meet you. My grandson has told me a lot about you. Well Grandpa William got embarrassed and quickly took a piece of meat and put it in his mouth. And I just smiled at such skill. At least wash your hands too. Teach, teach, and all to no avail. Grandpa sighed. I have one last batch left and I ask you to come to the table. It smells delicious, I snorted. It's all cooked according to an old recipe you might say, smiled Harry good-naturedly. To make good meat you must first of all choose good meat. True kebab connoisseurs say that kebab should not be cooked but created. It's a whole ritual. Well young people, welcome to the house. Take a pot of meat and let's go. Everything in the house was in rustic style minimum of furniture, wooden ceilings and floors, paintings on the walls. In the kitchen there was a huge oval table with a soft corner and greenish furniture. Please come to the table, Harry ordered. William escorted me into the bathroom where I could wash my hands and we sat down at the table. Harry opened my wine and generously filled my glasses. May, I drink to you purely symbolically. There was a huge bowl of kebab, greens, pickles and boiled potatoes on the table. Let's get acquainted. Harry raised his glass. William and I repeated. The host drank, grunted and quickly put the kebab on. A little bit of everything for everyone. The kebab was indeed very tasty. I enjoyed the food. Thank you. You're such a good cook. I had to but not entirely by choice. I only know how to cook a few meat dishes. My wife cooked everything else. But when she died, I had to stand by the stove. Grandpa, I'm home. We heard from behind the door. And another one of my grandsons is here. 
Harry said cheerfully, and William looked sad. We're in the kitchen, the man shouted, and then he entered the kitchen, Alex himself. I don't know which of us was more shocked. The man froze and stared at me. My heart gave a traitorous thud and beat harder. I missed him. Meet my grandson Alex, and this is May, William's teacher. Have a seat. The kebab's getting cold, Harry said. And we already know each other, Alex muttered. Yes? William asked uncomprehendingly. I looked at the man questioningly, giving him a chance to explain our casual acquaintance. We met on the road, Alex explained vaguely. And I didn't think we would meet again. He finished continuing to burn me with a look that clearly expressed his displeasure. Alex, sometimes I think you were raised on the street. Yeah, Grandpa. I'm sorry. I didn't realize you had company. I wouldn't have come. What are you talking about? Harry was indignant. I'm always happy to see you. You and William might as well get on good terms too. Grandpa, don't start. Alex wrinkled his nose as if from a toothache. He's always thinking about himself. He doesn't care about the whole world. William replied ironically. I didn't ask you, snapped his brother. Ask. No, the crown will fall, William said angrily. A family scandal was raging before my eyes. Harry, I'd better go with your permission. Let's postpone the meeting. May, I am very sorry for the behavior of my grandchildren, who don't seem to be out of childhood yet, said Harry with a sad look. William really looked hurt. Alex, on the other hand, looked rather annoyed. Perhaps we'll meet another time. In the meantime, I'll give you some cards that I think you'll be interested in. Harry walked out of the kitchen. I didn't meet him entirely disinterestedly. William's grandfather was a famous archaeologist and could help me with my little investigation. You're ruining everything. William couldn't help himself. Oh, wait a minute. I have no desire to get involved in your relationship. Have pity on me. I'm sorry, May. William was confused. What are you even doing here? Alex hissed in my ear. I'm meeting Harry. He has some maps I'm interested in. What kind of maps? Alex asked in confusion. Maps of ancient buildings. May, here you go. Harry came back into the kitchen and handed me a stack of documents. Thank you, Harry. We'll get back to you through William. Sorry again about my grandchildren. It's okay. It happens. Thank you for your time. William walked me to my car. I'm ashamed of my brother, he said. Quarrels are usually quite common. Sometimes you can't hide your irritation. It's better to get things straight. But my brother and I have a complicated relationship. As practice shows, it is the relationship in everyone's life that tops the list of unresolved problems. Relatives are given once and for all. Do not think about selfishness, about pride. Thanks for the invitation and have a good weekend. I returned home, barely restraining myself from impatience to look into the folder with maps that Harry gave me. On the way, I remembered in time to remember the lack of food in the fridge and stopped at the store. It took another 20 minutes to park the car and fly into the apartment, put the groceries in the fridge, get a drink of water, and finally sit down to look at the folder. A copy of Lugovoy's map of 1,846 opened before my eyes. The map shows most of the right bank and a bit of the left bank, including Blue Lake. It seems that the plan shows all the buildings, even barns, but instead of fortresses only their outlines. Also beautifully depicted is the monastery on the hills at the dam lake is an outpost with a bridge. The lake is considered a clay quarry, and even then there was a brickyard nearby. At the time of the map it was considered a farm. The creek runs through the low-lying area of the street. The map even showed the alleys in the park. Yes, incredibly interesting. When I took my eyes off the map, the clock showed it was already 2 o'clock in the morning. I jumped up, went to bed. Morning shower jeans and t-shirt, coffee, and I dialed the number of Mike's co-worker. Mike, I have something interesting. Can we meet right now? Why can't you sleep? Mike grunted and yawned loudly into the phone. Okay, come to my house. I'll be there in half an hour. Come on, my good man, get out of bed. We have great things to do, you cruel woman. Mike ended the conversation with a sorrowful tone. I quickly gathered the folder went to the quiet bedroom neighborhood where Mike lived, hardly found a parking space with a folder and a laptop in my hands. I ran to the fourth floor. The door was opened by a sleepy, shaggy-haired, slightly angry man. May, it's five in the morning. It's just work again. 
groaned Mike in the kitchen, munching on a sandwich. Work made a man out of a monkey. Work is the best way to start loving life. Is it worth it? Stop, you monster. Let's deal the cards. You're a systematic, unique, and irreplaceable friend. Why am I acting like a child? He asked skeptically. Because you are amazingly kind, empathetic, and wise, I said, unfolding the card. After hours of painstaking labor, we made a single map made up of maps from different times, thus gained new clues. Meanwhile, the delivery guy brought pizza and life seemed even better. Do you see that we have some interesting directions? I asked. I see that you are planning some kind of event, Mike answered with a question to a question. We'll figure it out on the spot. Let's plan for Saturday and then we'll see how this creation helps, I said, nodding at the map. And then I added, I could earn my fame as a ghost hunter. How? Mike came alive and looked at me questioningly. There was one warehouse built during construction. There's a sinkhole where one interesting find was discovered. On Wednesday, I plan to go down and see what's there. You coming with me? I wouldn't say no to that. Well, I'll pick you up then. Well, I gotta go. I've got some students waiting for me. I packed the folder with a sense of a job well done, but still no clear answer from the doctor. The examination dragged on. After a little while, I found some interesting material on my case. A certain Italian who lived a couple of centuries ago having visited Egypt was terribly fond of mummies and developed his own technique, which allowed to turn dead people into stone. Many of his works are still in the anatomical museum, but how it happened, no one could understand. With a sense of mild frustration at my own helplessness to get the information I needed, I took Mike and together we arrived at the warehouse of Jack's firm. The workers were already greeting us. As we changed clothes, the construction guy was talking non-stop. I looked at the worker questioningly. What does your intuition tell you? I asked him. Silent as the grave, the guy smirked. And it's mystical, I assure you. I definitely heard moaning. There's devils walking around. What about the engineering point of view? It doesn't fit in with the paranormal versions. The worker smirked, looking mockingly at the scientists. The young man led us to the doors of his hell. What am I supposed to do? He asked. Wait for us, Heron, I muttered, humming contemptuously. What if there really is something in there? He asked, biting his lower lip. Do you really believe in evil? Mike asked in a sinister voice. There are all sorts of things, cautiously replied the boy. The world existed long before us. Your knowledge of the world makes me incredibly happy. But we made our choice, and I went first to the wall, in which a hole was made before our arrival. This is a classic beginning, I laughed. It's like a black hole. Mike grinned and climbed in. I followed him, half bent, and we climbed up about five meters, and then there was enough room for us to straighten up and look around. There was a tunnel ahead of us. What do you think? Mike asked. I say let's see what happens next. Are you curious about what's in there too? Oh yeah. What kind of scary noises do they hear? Mike asked. What's the most likely version for you? Either one. Just don't tell me about the executions. In my opinion it's a trivial whistling of ventilation, I said. Why didn't they figure it out on their own? Acoustics can be quite deceptive. Or the house could be shrinking. There are a bunch of logical explanations, but Han, this is more interesting. There was no way to stomp any further. The ceiling was sinking lower, and I had to bend over, crawling forward. Mike chuckled behind me, clearly admiring my ass, tantalizingly crawling forward. Mike, does this remind you of anything? I took a close look around. The tunnel looked like an ancient cave made of stone. Why do I have to crawl through here? He puffed unhappily. The cellar it reminds me of soon will find pickle jars. That must have been it. We slowed down a lot before the power flow went down, looking every millimeter. But there was nothing interesting. There was an old bottle sticking out of the wall. We began to descend even lower. Crawled on our knees. Mike was panting. Our finish line was predictable. We'd reached a dead end. No options. Dead end. We go back. Other than mud and a torn shoe, we didn't find anything here, I said. Well, dear, I'll lie here, and back like a worm I'm not going to crawl like a worm. Let them dig me out with a backhoe. I could barely keep from giggling, but I restrained myself, keeping a serious look. 
I took out the bags and scooped up the samples. My companion was lying on his back, examining the ceiling and even trying to dig. And no hint of what a hand might be doing here. I love riddles, but when I can find the answer to them, I whispered. Are you whispering a spell in there? Wait, I'm not ready for your rituals, witch. You're always being such a baby, Mike. I'm creepy. It's easier with humor. Come here. Lie down next to me. Mike pulled my leg. Instead of landing on the ground, I landed on my companion. He took the note and gave me a big kiss on the lips. Ugh, Mike, give it a rest. What about the doc? Worse than you, but you're just my friends. Deal with it. I crawled forward, determined to get out of this tunnel as fast as I could. What did he decide about the forensics? Mike asked. Not the least bit upset by my refusal. For the first time, I can't get an answer out of him. And that's alarming. Wow. Mike coughed and hid what he was about to say. I walked toward the entrance. Mike howled behind me. Are you crazy? I looked back, but he was gone. A raspy echo echoed with eerie moans. I walked backwards. I looked around. I yelled. There was a horrible laughter. Mike, get the fuck out. I know it's you. I climbed out and was met by a worker. What's up? He asked me fearfully. Did you hear that? Well, I've never heard anything otherworldly before. Now my companion is fooling around, so I think the bottle was probably bricked up. That's why it's howling and it sounds like someone crying. And you knew about that, didn't you? That was my primitive theory. But the drilling had removed all the debris, but the moaning was still there. Was there anything else unexpected? I asked. This is a new building. There's nothing interesting here. No skeletons. Where's your friend? He's missing. And you're so calm? Oh yes, he's just a joker. There was laughter. The builder recoiled, crossed himself and started to run. I couldn't take it any longer, so I laughed too. Mike came out, smeared with earth, and uttered a phrase that made the worker fall into a stupor. I got two of them. Come on, finish this one. What's the matter? He whispered. Nothing interesting, Mike replied. I'd like to take a shower. What was howling in here? The boy realized, glancing warily at the Joker. Is it something otherworldly? The kid licked his lips. Mike and I looked at each other pitifully again. I could tell by the glint in his eyes that he was going to give the guy his version of the essence. The existence of an otherworldly force is not proven by science. An occasion for howls of lament and whatever else your imagination is capable of figuratively creating. Unfortunately, it's not original at all. And she's hiding in a bottle in the wall. That's where the howling is coming from. The worker froze, pondering the information provided. Come on, you horny worm. I whispered angrily in Mike's ear. He flinched. That's who you should be afraid of, the man muttered, squinting at me. She's the only one we've got and a poltergeist and a ghost or a ghost buster. Look, May, maybe you could actually work as a hunter. Can you imagine how many people's houses are creaking and people are spending all their money on priests? And here you are, all belligerent and microscopic. Mike, you wanted to eat, didn't you? Well, you go hungry. I'm not going to feed you. Mr. Sarcasm. Well, you see how stupid thoughts creep into your head on an empty stomach. You better feed me or I'll eat you. Mike moved toward me, spreading his arms wide. Come on, my hungry one. With a shriek, I bounced away. The kid who'd seen us off was already smiling, assuming we were a married couple. The week flew by, as usual, hectic. On Friday after class, William and I agreed to take the folder to Harry. William was eagerly waiting, spinning around in the car like a little kid. How was your week? I asked out of politeness. It was fine. How eloquent you are, I grinned. It was boring. Nothing interesting. Is this what it's like to be a science major? May, I'm studying. I know, I know. You are? I'm glad you're doing well. Thank you. However, half of what university teaches us is irrelevant. And it won't be useful in life. You never know when or what you'll need in life. I objected. You have a wonderful period of life now. Already grown up. But not yet burdened with problems so absorb knowledge like a sponge. Speaking of everyday life, we got there pretty quickly. Harry was walking around the yard. When he saw the car, he headed for the gate. Hello, he waved happily. Hello, Harry. Grandpa, hello. William jumped out of the car. How's it going, youngsters? We're fine. May can confirm it. 
William, we're out of bread. Go and get some. May and I will make tea in the meantime. All right, Grandpa. I'll be right back. William made his way briskly to the store and we went inside. Will you be having raspberry tea? He asked cheerfully. Harry started to make the tea and I sat down modestly at the table. Ah, May. I wanted to apologize for Alex's behavior. Harry suddenly turned serious. It's fine. There's no need to apologize, I replied. No, otherwise you'll think my grandson is a stupid fool. But he's not. He's going through a difficult time right now. His wife, whom he thought they were doing well, left him in a heartbeat. Alex is a complicated man. Life hasn't exactly spoiled him. I basically raised him. His father left him when he was little. My daughter remarried and William was born. But then my daughter was hit by a car. She died on the spot. William's father immediately gave up his son. I took him in, but he refused William. Later, in his teens, when he thought William was interfering with his new family happiness. That's how the boys ended up with me. Alex is quite secretive, doesn't know how to show his feelings. He feels like he's being vulnerable and resists it. But he takes it all hard. He just doesn't show it to anyone. I totally understand that just because a man doesn't show his feelings doesn't mean he doesn't have them. I hope so, Harry said cryptically. Especially since they have a complicated relationship with William right now. The door slammed, and William flew into the kitchen. I bought bread, and we have a mini bakery here. They make incredibly delicious pies. Good thing you did, Harry said and poured William a cup of tea. So, what about the maps? We've made a general map thanks to your sketches. Now we have a few places we need to check out. Good thing the folder came in handy. Harry smiled. I should get going now. May, you are welcome in my house. I would love to see all my old records and am willing to share my knowledge of the collectors in town. Thank you. I'd love to visit you again. Will you take me camping? William asked. I'd love to. We leave in two days. The only rule I had learned was that things could always go wrong. On the long-awaited day of our hike, Mike and William got stuck in the mud. We were all exhausted and tired, so we just didn't have the energy to walk. Nothing worthwhile was ever found. I invited my friends over to my house for a cup of tea. The ringing of the doorbell distracted me from our mutual conversation. Strange. I wasn't expecting anyone, I muttered to myself and went to open the door. Alex stood in the doorway, looking at me angrily. Alex? He's just a kid, the guest growled. What are you talking about now and what are you doing here? I saw you with him. I... I haven't seen any connection yet. Are you sleeping with my brother? His voice twitched and he let out a roar. Then the bathroom door opened. William jumped out of there. He was washing off the camping mud. Alex, what are you doing here? And I shifted my gaze from William in his towel to Alex, whose eyes were bloodshot. Yeah, awkward as it turned out. I rubbed my forehead thoughtfully and laughed out loud. Alex, shut up before the situation gets to the point of absurdity. William. I need to talk to your brother alone, so you take Mike and go to the room. I'm not going to do anything to him. I'm not going to kill him. I'm not going to make him a mummy. We're just going to talk before he makes up a whole orgy in here. Get out! I barked at Mike. Stop hiding and choking on your laughter. Mike laughed and walked out of the kitchen. Oh, who am I? I'm nothing. Well, May, you're a maniac. You're a maniac. She's got it in for the young guys. Now it's payback time. He choked with laughter and led a deep red William into the room. Alex go to the kitchen. That was the end of the men. This is an unfortunate misunderstanding. I agree. It looks ambiguous. What really is? His ironic tone made me cringe. How could it be a misunderstanding with my naked brother? Fool, I'm not sleeping with him. We were hiking for science and got into a terribly muddy section of the tunnel. William tripped there and stretched himself to his full height. As a result, he ended up in the mud. I couldn't send him home like that. Where did you see us? Near the subway station. Why didn't you just call? I did. William's cell phone was out of range. Alex was still angry. Who's that other body wandering around the apartment? That's my friend. I snorted, choking on my laughter. Let me get this straight. We all share a common passion for exploring dungeons. We are interested in walking, looking, photographing, exploring. Moreover, we cooperate with city services, monitor inaccessible communications, 
report all faults, and there are many of them. We have close friendly relations and nothing more, and I certainly have no relationship with your brother. Did I make that clear? Alex looked indignant. He was silent for a few minutes. Perhaps I should apologize for my prank, he said, lowering his head grimly. I misunderstood. Apology accepted. Coffee, tea. I put the kettle on, took out the box of chocolates that saved me when I had unexpected guests. I made tea for William, coffee for Mike, looked questioningly at the fox. Tea. He snorted, his eyes fixed on me. That look was like an electric shock that traveled through my body. For the first time in a long time, I felt a shiver. Mike, William, go drink tea, I shouted to the boys. The boys were full of undisguised interest in what was going on here. William cast an accusing glance at his brother with a disgruntled face. Alex looked equally confused, though he tried to keep his feelings under control. Meet Mike. Our computer genius has a knack for breaking, fixing, and getting into all sorts of trouble just because it's interesting. Mike, as you may have realized by now, is William's caring brother Alex. I don't know what he does, but he's a bad driver. And William, if you're trying to burn your brother with your eyes, you should know that it doesn't work. Witches burn at the stake, I said. May, you're an asshole, Mike muttered. Shut up and eat your candy, I smiled. How was your walk today? Not cool today, William shook his head. My elbows and knees are all banged up. Have you been interested in this for a long time? Alex asked. Since high school, I've been following my grandfather. He used to go everywhere too. I spent all my vacations on excavations. I think we should go, Alex said hesitantly, looking at me warmly. Thank you for the tea, he was being polite. You're welcome, William. He looked at his brother questioningly. Okay, I'm coming too. Thanks for the walk. Mike kissed me on the cheek and I was suddenly alone. And after a boring day and obsessive thoughts about Alex, my lecture was coming to an end. I looked around at the audience. They weren't children, but they weren't adults. And lastly, don't follow everyone else. Choose your path, listen to yourself and choose what you can't imagine your life without. Choose a goal and then work hard day after day. You are bound to be told that you won't succeed. Don't listen to them. Don't pay attention to them. You will only have a goal and your belief in yourself. Nothing else matters. Now thank you all. This lecture is over. See you next week. As always, we all said thank you. Everyone bustled around and started to pack up. I walked out of the classroom to the cafeteria where Tim was sitting with his head sadly propped up, grabbed a coffee and cake and sat down next to him. Hi, welcome back. Why are you so sad? Tim squinted his eyes. I have a toothache. He answered casually. Have you tried going to the dentist? I wouldn't have guessed without you. I'm waiting to see if it goes away, Tim said miserably. I'm a grown man. I don't understand how you can be so irresponsible about your own health. But on the mind of one car looking into every nut, how can you be so careless with yourself? Don't pick on me. It's bad enough without you. Go to the dentist once a year for a checkup and your teeth will live happily ever after. I hate you. He gave his verdict. Here we go. I thought you respected me. I'm asking about your boring life. Not giving up. I picked up the phone and started dialing the number of a familiar dentist. To the cheerful voice of the receptionist, I asked to make an appointment for the next appointment. It was good to know there was a window. About an hour and a half later, Tim looked at me with compassion. I'll be with you, my friend. That's what scares me. Where do you get all this optimism? I have a rule of thumb. Everything is a comparison. Right now you have a toothache. But what if you imagine you lost your leg? You have to admit, it's not that bad. May, you're a good girl. Why don't you go somewhere far away? I'll be waiting by my car in an hour to pick him up in person and make sure he doesn't run out the window. I used to love Tim but it was more like kinship. What is love? It is labor of selflessness and joy, an interested attitude toward human beings, a sense of mature, free individuals. After all, we want to be loved and cared for. This is how life is made up of strange, tiny episodes, which then somewhere on the slope of years add up to a full-fledged picture. Tim was always there for me. I was used to it, but my soul was waiting for something more, and my heart was aching. 
At the memory of that long ago accident and Alex's piercing gaze, I cared about him and I just wanted to take care of Tim. I'm beginning to understand why your husband divorced you, Tim said sarcastically. I can be tender and vulnerable. It didn't work out with you. You're married. Men don't get along with you, he said. By the way, I was talking to Alex the other day. Oh, cool. You made a new friend? Come on, no sarcasm. And I told about the racy situation with his brother in the apartment. Tim couldn't stand it and laughed. Did you? No, I was just visualizing it. Maybe it's time for you to stop being snide. I asked him gently. I'll get my serious thoughts together, he replied with a sigh. That weekend we met William to explore another area. In the evening we went to a cafe. As they say coffee isn't a luxury, it's a means of transportation. I muttered as I stirred the sugar. Tired as hell. Me too. May, I forgot to tell you my grandfather found more maps and records. If you want we can come and get them, William said. It's too late, let's reschedule for next week when it's convenient. Is Saturday okay? Asked William. It's fine. I drove him home. I think I overestimated my strength. Another tedious week ahead. But it flew by. I watched the days on the calendar with some sadness. Nothing was happening in my life. Rare meetings with Tim. Thoughts of Alex. Whether it was spring or just old age. But I barely made it through the weekend. Even on Friday the thought of going away for the weekend scared me a little. But on a sunny Saturday morning, I happily jumped out of bed to loud music, cleaned the apartment to the rhythm of the tango, and got myself in shape. On the way I bought pastries at my favorite cafe. The road loud music in the car incredibly beautiful sunny and warm weather led to a surge of optimism that was invigorating. I also thought I was going to meet Alex. Smoke was visible from the yard. As soon as I got out of the car, I realized there was a smell in addition to the smoke. The gate opened, and Viliam came out to meet me. Good afternoon, May. Hi, what are you cooking? I could smell the air filled with various delicious aromas. It's going to be soup, he smiled. I took some cakes out of the trunk. Viliam took the package from my hands and ran happily towards the house. I went to say hello to Harry, but he wasn't alone at the kebab. Alex was standing next to him. His face stretched out at the sight of me. I flinched and lowered my eyes. My heart started to pound. Hi. I'm not interrupting anything, am I? I asked, a little embarrassed. Good afternoon to you too, May, Harry said with a smile. I'm really glad you came. Hello? Alex snorted in a disgruntled voice, eyeing my figure intently. I felt hot. My legs gave out, and I stumbled over some driftwood. Alex was there in time to pick me up. The sensation of being so close to his hot hands. I felt dizzy. I shook my hair out of my face, pulling myself up and backing away angrily. Careful we can leave Alex here and go inside. I'll show you something. We went into the house. On the way I calmed my heart a little, trying to get the naughty thoughts of Alex out of my head. Harry led me into the room and sat me down on the couch, a stack of newspapers, magazines and maps on the table beside him. Let's see. I still have some old notes. I think you'll find them useful. Grandpa. Did you show the old sewer records? William ran into the room. Now he pulled out another map and we rounded it up together. So engrossed in looking at it, so we didn't even immediately react to Alex calling us over to the table. Yeah, we're on our way, Harry replied. We finally moved into the kitchen. There were a lot of questions, and our conversation kept coming back to the maps we had seen. Only Alex sat silently, just watching us. Gradually his forehead smoothed out, and he stopped looking like a gloomy old man. How is my student doing? Harry asked, as well as everyone else with mixed success. How's he doing on his grading? Well, of course, his knees are not shaking. No one faints during exams. You see, times are different and students are different. If in the past, cheat sheets were pulled out of pockets, now modern gadgets have solved this issue. So how do you deal with them? With a bit of humor, I smiled. It was like that in my time, too. I remember we were taking an exam, sitting and writing. The dean came in and asked, Well, how are you cheating lovers? And the teacher replied that no, there are amateurs in the corridor. Only professionals are left here. And you, Alex, how did you study? Suddenly I asked the silent Alex. I studied and prepared, he answered. Harry sighed and then started telling more stories from his life. 
I laughed heartily. Even Alex smiled a couple times. That's where it was good. I genuinely enjoyed the simple stories, the sitting around. It seemed like a whole other world. A week later, I was sitting alone in the kitchen as usual. My idyll was interrupted by a persistent, insistent doorbell. I went to open the door, as if I had found a treasure trove of bandits and they had decided to break in on me. I rushed to open the door. Alex stood in the doorway furious. This is all your fault, he declared without explanation. I stared at him, surprised, to say the least. And to elaborate? My brother disappeared in those damn catacombs, Alex exclaimed. Why did you think so? He jumped out of the house like a scalded man, and we can't find him for six hours. All he could do was crawl into those damn dungeons. What makes you so sure he went into the catacombs? I asked. Because we had a fight with him, he answered doomily, and we can't find him anywhere. Alex doesn't go in there without a guide, alone, especially with a sense of anger. We go into the dungeon prepared. My brother climbed, he grabbed his gear and climbed. Alex whispered angrily, if anything happens to him, it's me. And how many hours have we not heard from him? It's been six. Damn it. I dialed Mike's number. Mike, we have an emergency meeting. We suspect William's gone into the catacombs. No one's been able to find him for six hours. Why are they creating panic? The man asked in amazement. Mike, we need to find William, where he might have gone. Do you have any ideas? Maybe the well of eternal weeping? Okay, I'll take a look. I'll be in touch. Call me if you need anything. Come on. With the phone in my hand, I'm going to get the equipment. I'm coming with you. Alex stood over me. Out of place, I was seized by an irresistible desire. This man excited me. I sighed but answered coldly. Do you have any experience underground? No, but I'll go, Alex roared. And you make it difficult for me. I gently tried to convince him with common sense. Then I'll have to rescue you and look for you. I'll go with you. But common sense didn't get through to him. We went down to the yard. Alex's Jeep was parked in the driveway. I got in the front seat. I typed a route into the navigator. We drove in silence. The man next to me was breathing heavily, and the thought of him was driving me crazy. I pulled myself together and spoke. Alex, it's going to be okay. William is not a young man in his infancy. He's already an experienced searcher, and people like that don't risk their lives needlessly. But he's just a kid. Calm down. He's already 18 years old, and he's capable of taking responsibility for his actions. Risking his life going underground is not what I want for him. Would you? He didn't say anything. I looked at him questioningly, but he didn't continue. What about me? Don't overreact or overreact. Nothing terrible has happened yet. It's been seven hours since I haven't heard from my brother, and that's fine. Park. Alex stopped the car. Now look at me. I don't care about your feelings or accusations right now. I brutally reprimanded. You can go with me as soon as you can control yourself. It's okay. There's nothing to worry about. He gritted his teeth and his eye and lip, twitching nervously, said otherwise. The hell with you, Change. I tossed him my backpack, started to dress myself. He looked at me warmly at my figure and began to dress. Helmet on his head, he twirled the helmet, pulled it on with great doubt. I walked over to him, stood on tiptoe and turned on the flashlight on his forehead. He looked up in surprise, the light glinting in his eyes. My heart sank at the closeness of the man I wanted. Sighing, I pulled away. I went to the well hatch and removed the cast iron lid. A narrow passage into the darkness opened before us. We went into the tunnel. The clay slid under our feet. There was nothing to be afraid of, nothing to be disgusted by. There might be rats, stuff in there. You all right? Yeah. Okay. Then tilt your head. Ideally, follow my lead and let me know if you feel dizzy. Okay? Yes. He gave me a sneering look at me in my commanding tone. A low ceilinged corridor led us into a vaulted tunnel beginning our descent into the depths of the system. I commented for Alex. Indeed, we quickly reached a small room. The ceiling was higher here and the water level was up to ankle deep. We will now rest for a few minutes. We have a challenging route ahead of us. Are you sure you are not claustrophobic? No, Alex answered. 
but his voice was unsure. After resting for a couple of minutes and drinking water, we moved on. In general, we had to be extremely careful in underground communications. There are a huge number of corridors here, which are similar to each other. We walked on, reaching a rusty staircase which I started to climb. Alex followed, and we found ourselves in a narrow passage. There was a very low ceiling. A companion with his height had to walk in a half-bent state. I realize that the sensations are not pleasant, but it's okay. Is it? There was sarcasm in his voice. The rocks crunched under my feet. What's that nasty crunching sound? Yeah, they're water-rolled rocks. The ceiling's gonna come down soon. It's gonna be very narrow. And I'll tell you right away we won't get stuck there. We'll just have to crawl. However, Alex hissed and knelt down. It's okay. The corridor will widen soon. Indeed, the hatch began to widen. We managed to get to our feet, bent in half. We walked for a while until the corridor we'd need into a rather large room. And the first thing we saw was the light of a flashlight and an incredibly surprised William with some guy. William, why the hell did you come in here? You don't have to yell, I told Alex. The ceiling could collapse. William, are you okay? Yeah, he answered hesitantly. Alex, what are you doing here? William seemed puzzled by his brother's appearance. What's that? I gritted my teeth when I saw the fish and beer on the makeshift table, the boys following my gaze. Yeah, we, may, we. They mumbled in two voices. Out. Both due to the fact that on my quiet evening I had to climb the sewers. You're in for a serious talk. May. They whimpered with glee. Let's go upstairs. I bellowed. The boys quickly started to pack up. Alex stood there with a slightly pale face watching them fuss. After a while we came to the surface. Everyone was tired, so we sat on the ground for a while recovering in the fresh air. In general, in search of you guys, we walked about five kilometers. I really want to talk to you guys. I called Mike, told him we found the guys. I was worried. Grandpa was worried. Why the hell did you go up there? Alex couldn't help himself. They didn't ask you, mumbled William. Did you want me to sit up early? I'll drive you. Alex looked at me confused. I'll drive myself, I replied. But all three of them looked at me with pity. Okay, take me home. I'm very happy to see you both safe and sound. We'll talk tomorrow. Why did you guys freak out like that? I wanted to stay home and I wasn't planning on going underground. Any more questions? But there was no danger, replied William. For you it was, but not for others. By your rash action, you have raised the ears of our scientific community. I raised everyone. Alex, why the hell are you getting involved in my life? William asked angrily, ignoring the look in my eyes. William, he's meddling in your life because you're his brother. Because he cares, I said. I don't need a brother like that. William grumbled. Don't talk nonsense, I said tiredly. William... I suspect your brother has many faults, but he is your brother. He is dear to you, so accept that he is human, that he too can make mistakes, that he can have guilt, that he can make bad decisions, worry and fret about you. You're making excuses for him. Have you fallen in love or something? William asked bitterly. No, I'm looking at it from the outside, from the point of view of someone who has already lost people close to him. I have too. His voice trailed off. I know. I'm sorry. But you have to cry for the living. You know, live for those who love you. We always remember the people who are gone. We love them, and we miss them. But take care of yourself. Take care of the people who are around you. You have each other. I have no one and never had a brother or sister. And I always envied those who had siblings, those moments when they got together as a family. Well, you two are behaving worse than spoiled children. Can't you realize that your little brother is all grown up and sees the world differently than he does? Just accept that his brother loves him. I wanted to continue, but we had already pulled up to Harry's house, where the light in the windows was still glowing. Run along, I smiled. Harry apparently hadn't gone to bed yet. William got out of the car hesitantly, looked at his brother, and went into the house. We waited for the door to open, and Alex drove me home. I'm sorry I ruined your day off. He mumbled quietly. Sometimes I get a little carried away. I get it. Could you tell me about your Star Wars experience with your brother? 
What did you say to him that you came running to me so scared? I don't want to talk about it. He frowned. Too bad, because someone needs to talk to you. Alex, your brother is incredibly vulnerable. He hides it under a lot of fun and indifference, but he's very sensitive and needs support. I'm like Darth Vader, he concluded thoughtfully. And I couldn't help laughing. The main thing to remember is that guilt is like alcohol. In small doses, it's medicine, but in large doses, it's poison, a philosopher and a righteous woman. It's time to stop the psychotherapy session, I replied. Did I say something wrong? Asked Alex. No, everything is fine. But are you offended? No. Where did you get that from? But you abruptly stopped talking and stared out the window. You're observant. But where did I go wrong? Alex, it's midnight. I want to sleep. Sorry, he said through clenched teeth. I'll stop by for coffee. You want one? Yeah, have a latte. Just a latte, nothing else? Uh, thanks. Just coffee. And I stayed in the car waiting for him. I couldn't feel anything. Out of boredom, I started looking at his car. I found bottles of energy drink in the doorway. Here. Alex handed me a coffee and a candy bar, and sat down with a big cup. Thank you. While we drank the coffee, I looked at Alex. He looked tired. How many cups of coffee do you drink a day? Ten or more, he said thoughtfully. And then energy drinks? Sometimes to stay awake while driving. So how long do you sleep? Well, sometimes four or two hours. I fall asleep at three in the morning, why? Now I was looking at him with a mixture of horror and pity. Nothing. You just need more sleep. I can't sleep. He sighed grimly. Divorce and all that. Alex, I understand that you're going through a hard time right now. I'm hurting and it's not going away, the man replied. When a relationship breaks down, it always hurts. But it's not better to leave your body exhausted. You react to everything acutely and painfully precisely because you don't get enough sleep, because you drink energy. It's a vicious cycle. Look, you can't treat yourself like this. I realize divorce is never easy. Your life is falling apart. Everything hurts. Everything gets ripped apart. But after a divorce, life goes on. It's gonna be different. It'll work out. It just takes time. Start simple. Cut back on the coffee. Cut down on energy drinks, exercise. It'll get rid of the stupid thoughts and you'll start to feel better physically. How do you know that? Alex asked. Because I've already been through it. Alex stopped talking, finally looking at me with interest. Alex, I can be extremely persistent in achieving my goal. What I'm asking you to do isn't hard, so let's try it together. Oh, come on, I'll explain again. Fatigue doesn't disappear, it builds up. A heart attack at 30 is the norm. Maybe you're right, I'll give it a try. Give me your cell phone, I'll call and supervise. I said. Alex drove me to the driveway, waited until I entered the house before he left. Strangely enough, we started texting and I felt happy and caught every message eagerly. Hello, how are you doing? I wrote the first one. Thank you, I'm fine. I went to the gym today, he replied. How do you feel? I can't feel my legs and arms, everything hurts. It's the result of the lactic acid. Try drinking lots of plain water. Drinking water will help reduce the amount of lactic acid. And green tea, cherry or pomegranate juice are rich in antioxidants. They help repair damaged muscles quickly. I'm gonna try a cold shower. No, it's better to take a hot bath. It'll improve circulation and help the acid drain quickly. Okay, I'm going to the bathroom. We texted every day. It became a habit. Divorce was hard on him. My own divorce was easy for me. We just decided we had to split up. Life didn't turn upside down, although my ex-husband still didn't accept the fact that we were getting a very peaceful divorce. Everyone's life went on. Alex was like a ball of nerves stretched out like electricity that you don't want to get into because it'll kill you. How's it going? Did you sleep tonight? I started texting. It didn't work. I couldn't sleep. Once again, at this rate of life, you can drive yourself to the grave. If you want to live, take care of yourself. If you can't deal with what's in your head, go to a psychologist. I've had enough of you. A psychologist can help you sort out your problems. I was quicker to answer. Am I distracting you? No. Alex, 
Everyone has moments when life doesn't seem fun. I've been there too. Sometimes moral support is important. I understand how you feel, but I think you can live your life differently. And my life has been surprisingly miserable lately. Lots of work, virtual socializing with friends. Everyone's been incredibly busy this spring. Only texting Alex has kept me warm. Hey, what are you doing? Hey, I'm doing a report on what I saw in the tunnel. Doing boring work. What are you doing? I'm checking the estimates. The older you get, the more boring things get. I sent a smiley face reply. You're gonna scold me again. I didn't get any sleep tonight. What is this self-destructive tendency? It's up to you how you live your life. We had these conversations almost every day. I didn't feel warm from him. I wanted that man to be there for me. But he couldn't turn toward rebirth. Ordinary life was happy with rain. It was raining outside the window. In the auditorium sat sleepy and sad freshmen, yesterday school children who could not understand what they were doing here. I sighed, started the lecture. With my side vision, I noticed movement from the doorway. Thomas, good morning to you. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. May I come in? The student asked, hiding his gaze from me. I can't deny the desire for knowledge. He didn't even raise an eyebrow. He came over and sat down. During the lecture, I ran my eyes over him a couple times. No, there's something wrong with him today. Pale, staring at one point, flinching every now and then. What the hell do we expect from this student? What are the effects of sleep deprivation now? Drug use. What happened to this smart kid? Well, yes, it's hard to hold the attention of today's kids, so I have to present information to young talent in a relaxed manner, in an interesting and accessible format. Each of my lectures is like a one-actor performance with quotation, contrast, hints, humor, pauses, dramatization of speech and emotionality. Sometimes it seems that people prepare less for war than I do for lectures. I squinted at Thomas again, sitting there with a completely absent look. Come on me, gritted my teeth. What should I expect from him? I opened my notebook. So I have the next window. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. I'll see you soon. Friday. I was kindly prompted by two voices from the group. Yes, Friday. Thomas, I'm going to ask you to stay. To what do I owe your attention, he said. I invite you to my office. But I haven't done anything. I don't blame you for anything. He walked into the office, threw his bag on the floor, sat down and propped his head up with his hand. He didn't look like he needed sympathy. No one said this was going to be easy. I'm concerned about your condition. What's wrong? After I asked him that, he went numb. What makes you think something happened? And why should I talk to you about it? The road begins with the first step. What's eating you, I asked. It's personal. Thomas, did you kill someone? Why is he staring at me? Your genuine surprise means no. I was scheduled for a tonsillectomy. Long story short, I didn't even know my blood type, so I had to give blood. My mom was with me. The doctor looked at me and said I had a pretty rare type 4. When I asked which of my parents had it, and my mom replied no one. The doctor laughed and asked, Are you sure it was the baby's father? Because children inherit the blood type of one of their parents. And the mom didn't say anything, she just walked out. So the dad's not my dad. Isn't this my family at all? As you probably know, there are four blood types. When the father's blood type 2 and the mother's blood type 3 are combined with a 25% chance the child can inherit any of the four blood types. So you have a fourth, your brother or sister? Theoretically, it could be any of them. It could be that all four children could have different blood types. So these are my parents? If the only thing that bothered you was that your blood type didn't match your father's, that's fine. And he pulled out his phone, opened the gallery, and held out to me a smiling man and woman standing there hugging. They were his parents. I looked at the photo and how it occurred to him to doubt that he might not be their son. A chin like your father's is also called a stubborn chin. Pay attention to your appearance. You also inherited your father's broad cheekbones. So I wasn't replaced at the birth center? No, you weren't replaced or kidnapped. Why did the doctor say that? And mom didn't say anything. Mom didn't say anything because she was probably speechless at the stupidity of it. I suggest you go to school after all. It's the third period in 10 minutes. Yes, thank you. Is everything okay? I think so. Thomas nodded and left the office. So much for childish problems. 
I looked at my notebook and bravely prepared for the next lecture. Hi, how are you sleeping? I kept asking the same question. You may not believe this, but I slept for 12 hours. Oh, cheerful and energetic now. Pretty old and rotten. What are you, like, 40 years old? Yes. I repeat, young, healthy, vigorous, and with a whole life ahead of me. If you've got your health, you've got everything else. This is just the beginning. I don't know if I can do it again. What scares you so much? Loneliness. You're not alone. You have a family that loves you. I only have friends. I'm going back to the apartment and it's crazy how empty it is. Look, now you have a great opportunity to hear yourself. Think about what you like to do. What are your hobbies? I don't have any hobbies. I work 14 hours a day. It's time to rethink my work schedule because there should be a balanced work and rest schedule. But I like my job. What else? I used to like fishing. I hardly have time for it though. I can't even remember the last time I went fishing. Any other dreams? I don't have anything. It's all gone. But think about what you'd like to do outside of work. And you get a dead man. He wrote and put a sad smiley face. The phone rang. A co-worker was inviting me to a meeting. I was distracted from texting. In the meantime, several messages from Alex had arrived. The first one started with the question, are you not offended? A little later, another one. Sorry, I didn't mean anything like that. The other. Why aren't you going to talk to me? I rubbed my forehead thoughtfully, remembering that this was just such a family of vulnerable men. But I was glad for the attention from the man I'd been dreaming of. He cared too. Alex, I'm not mad at you. It takes a lot of effort to offend me. It's just that sometimes I can't answer right away. I'm working, I get distracted by calls. Let's just agree that sometimes I'm busy. Sometimes I don't feel comfortable answering right away, and sometimes I can't hear the phone. And why on earth would you even suspect that I have a grudge against you all the time? I texted him. I don't know. I felt like my life wasn't going to be the same anymore. Alex was on my mind. Even a text from Doc didn't do much to cheer me up. All my thinking and speculations, studying maps, researching historical materials were in vain. I had to hear the phrase that finally killed the gravedigger in me. May, spoke into the phone Doc Doomed voice. I have to inform you that your mummy, this hand, is a complete lame. It's a piece of a stone statue that once stood in the center of town. Thank you, my dear. Your work is invaluable. Don't feel bad. Come on, bye-bye, Angel. After work, I walked home doomed. The world didn't seem so rosy anymore. William told me that Fox's wife was pregnant and wanted to come back to him. Pregnant with Alex. Could it be true? The news made me completely despondent. I walked into my apartment, pulled out my phone, saw the missed calls from Alex. I grimaced, went to the bathroom, climbed under the hot shower. True, she couldn't wash the feeling of dirt from her soul. It seemed that longing and sadness had descended on my shoulders with a multi-ton weight. I walked to the kitchen. The food made me nauseous, so I went back to the bedroom. I lay down on the couch, wrapped in a blanket. How did the women in the harem share the sultan? No wonder why they poisoned each other. Bitterness, confusion, total disorder, and confusion. And self-pity. Okay, first things first. I think I had some valerian somewhere, so I went to the kitchen. I found the medicine, took out the instructions, took 30 drops. I thought about it, added 20 more and drank it, leaving a tang of alcohol in my mouth. I went back to bed. So for today, I'll try to calm down and sleep. Tomorrow, maybe, life will be easier. And tomorrow, I'll approach the problems from the practical point of view of common sense. I'll get through today. The valerian did its job and I fell asleep. I woke up with a square head. In the mirror too, I was looking at something so scary, like a ghost. It made me a little twisted. I got in the shower. I came out of there feeling better. I ran briskly to the kitchen. Hot coffee and lots of good food do wonders, I muttered to myself and got to work making breakfast. I made myself a huge omelet, brewed some coffee, and it was already better. Life is no longer so gray and worthless, I cheered myself up. Dressed in a pantsuit on my head made a ponytail and even a modest makeup painted. Well, life is a wonderful thing, and sometimes the truth brings all sorts of surprises. But without them, it would be boring. 
and so sad, hysterical, it's all to appreciate what we have. I packed my bag, looked in my phone. There was a huge number of missed calls from Alex. I ignored it. I wasn't ready to talk to him yet, threw my phone in my bag, and went to work. I didn't get very far. Outside the house I saw Alex's car and him, ruffled hair, stubble, black circles under his eyes. I was confused. He was the last person I expected to see. And I walked slowly to the car, trying to steady my heart. Alex. I knocked on the window. He was confused at the sight of me too and got out of the car. I'm not stalking you, I was just worried. You weren't answering your cell phone. I thought I'd check to make sure you were okay. I looked at him and he stood there looking grim. This is the man I was madly in love with. He dumped me yesterday. His wife came back to have his baby, but he looked very unhappy. It's all right. I was somewhat shocked by this news, confused, shocked. It took a while to get my head around it and move on. I can't say I'm taking it easy yet, but I think I will. What about me? He exhaled nervously. Are you going to work? Yeah. Can I drive you? I wanted to say no. It hurt physically to see him, and at the same time, I wanted to see him, and the collapse of my feelings hurt my soul. Alex's gaze was so longing, so inexpressible, and I said yes. Okay. Okay. I went around and sat next to him. What about you? I can't take it either, he exhaled. I don't know what to say. I feel bad without you. I'm sorry. I don't know what to do next. I can't sleep, and I'm sorry. He stopped talking abruptly. I feel bad right now too. I decided to be honest. And there was no way I was going to be cold. When a tsunami of fire hits, I wasn't looking for feelings. I wasn't expecting anything. But you somehow managed to get under my skin. I stopped talking, noticing that he was about to rip the steering wheel off. I don't know how to move on. I need you. He got it out of him. He pulled over to the curb, wrapped his arms around me, and kissed me fiercely. I gasped at the sensation. I couldn't resist the passion any longer. Alex, it's going to be okay. I suddenly burst out. Maybe not right away, but it would be. There was something between us, and it suddenly stopped. It's painful to be torn apart by living feelings. But life goes on, and passions will subside. After my words, Alex shut down. His hands were trembling, and it looked like he was putting a lot of effort into just driving. I exhaled with relief when we pulled into the parking lot. Only then did Alex turn to me. The doom in his gaze made me twitch. We're adults, and we'll get through this, I said hastily, either to reassure myself or to reassure him. You think so? Don't worry. I barely smiled. I have to go, and I reached for the handle on the door. Don't go. He grabbed my arm. I shifted my gaze to him. Alex, I can't let you go. He tilted his head and I stroked his hair. I have to leave. It'll be okay, I said and got out of the car. I didn't even look back once, even though my soul was tearing up. But how could I explain to her that I didn't need her? Sometimes it's like that. One loves and one doesn't. It'll pass. So will this. I'm not a young teenager with hormones running wild. Life took the rose-colored glasses off my eyes a long time ago. I approached a familiar boy with a street coffee. He handed me a cup without ordering it. On the machine I took out the money, mat my head that I do not need change, and with heavy thoughts just swaddled my body, I went to my workplace. Next to me, students were running in joyful flocks with cheerfulness, saying hello, and then looking back at me. Apparently not all was right with my face. I inhaled, exhaled, squared my shoulders, tried to portray a polite expression. I made it to the office. The mirror hinted that some madness still lived in my eyes. The lecture was still ten minutes away. I tried to clean myself up or at least look like it. I'm here and now, and that's the most important thing. And I even managed to have a productive day at work. I went down to the cafe when the headache was just gnawing at me. I grabbed a cup of coffee, a brownie, and a chocolate bar. Tim joined me with a tray of food. What kind of martyr is this? Hello to you too. I'm fine. I brushed off his question. Are you okay? Don't bullshit me. She's fine. Nobody died? You're sitting there with such a tragic look on your face. 
I put the cake down and looked up and smiled happily at Tim. I figured you'd be better off alone, my smarty pants. I looked away from him and focused on the brownie again. Really, May? What's going on? I'm not ready to talk yet, but nothing scary has happened. You scare me so much. I moved in. Not stupid that you're better off not being touched, Tim replied in an offended tone. But I'm worried. Then we'll talk about it later. Tell me what's interesting. The ordinary, boring life of a family man? By the way, I went fishing with the kid, didn't catch any fish. I had to catch my son all over the beach. Then I had to catch a tick on my son, and then I gave up and realized that the next fishing trip will be at least 10 years away. Alex was gone. He disconnected his cell phone and stopped contacting me. Over the weekend, I went to see Harry. He asked me to deal with his eldest grandson who had stopped talking to everyone, refused to eat, drink, or leave his room. I was met by Alex. His gait and demeanor had changed. He was not the nervous man I had met the first time, but there was something heavy in his gaze. Hey, how are you? He nodded, staring into my eyes, his piercing gaze making my heart race. I don't know what was in my eyes, but he flinched, lowered his head and went into the house. I joined Harry in the kitchen. You succeeded. A faint smile appeared on his face. He came out of the room to meet you. You don't say, I'm surprised myself. Alex is listening to you, Harry said, deftly picking up the food on the table. I think William and I will take a walk and give you a chance to talk. My excitement was so palpably that it seemed almost tangible. I made myself coffee and tea for Alex. He walked in, clean-shaven and even wearing a new t-shirt and jeans. I barely managed to take my eyes off him. Desire swept over me. I bit my lip to steady my breathing. Only Alex continued to stand and stare at me. Sit down. We need to eat. He sat down. I handed him a bowl of broth and sat down with a cup of coffee in front of him. He took the spoon, put it back on the table and finally picked it up again and started eating. You scared everyone. Did something happen? Yes. He lowered his eyes and fell silent. I got up to make myself another cup of coffee. He looked at me. She said it was my baby. He began to speak hurriedly. I went with her to the ultrasound. I wanted to see the baby. The doctor said everything was fine and that at 22nd week of pregnancy everything was normal. I asked her if she could have been wrong about the due date, but the doctor said that everything was correct. Then I had a chance to talk to Kate, my ex-wife. She cried, but finally admitted that it wasn't my baby, but her new husband's, who was a scumbag and left her pregnant because he didn't want kids. She had the good idea to come back to me and tell me it was my baby. I can't be with her. I can't see her. He jumped up nervously from the table strode across the kitchen, poured himself a glass of water. I remained seated, shocked by his words. And yes, I was jealous. If it wasn't for the ultrasound, I would be living this deception with her. He was choking on his own emotions. Calm down, Alex. I walked over to him. I've already calmed down. She's not only unfaithful and selfish. She expects me to support both her and her child after the betrayal. I'm sorry to tell you this. I'm sorry. I just don't know what to do next. You were at the epicenter of my life. Can you forgive me? I have nothing to forgive you for. Alex swallowed hard. His gaze slid nervously over me. I thought about you, imagining our meeting, practicing my speech. Oh, there's going to be a speech. I dared to look into his confused eyes and then, to my infinite surprise, an embarrassed blush broke out on his cheekbones. What am I supposed to do? He exhaled confusedly. It's like a powder keg with you. I don't know what's going to explode and when. He blinked at me but didn't look away. Even with you, I experienced the most vivid feelings and dizzying emotions. Actually, a bunch of other emotions. And I missed you terribly. It seemed to me that time didn't move. And I missed you. I need you. He mumbled and froze. And I even started writing poems. I'm willing to trade them for my love. I thought his jaw dropped in surprise. For the hundredth time that night, and his hand went to his heart, lightly rubbed his chest. Did you fake a heart attack here? He hugged me gently. Tears rolled down his cheeks. How did I wait for you? He finally managed to speak. How I wanted you. No, I was thinking about you every minute. He sighed. The softness of his soft lips felt like the ultimate bliss. The kiss was unobtrusive, reverent, tender, 
the invincible skeptic Alex was defeated. I ran my hand gently down the back of his neck, ran my hand through his hair, gently clenched it in my fist, and greedily kissed him again and again, savoring his scent, his taste, his warmth. He kissed me as if his life depended on it. When we broke the kiss, I barely had time to pull myself together. We were in the kitchen next to my Alex, with heavy breathing coming out of his chest, and Harry and William walking somewhere outside. Another moment, and we were on the floor. Alex, I said with difficulty, what are we doing? Yours will be home soon. We're doing everything I dreamed of, he replied. Harry and William have been politely strolling around the courtyard for quite some time now. Damn. His eyes suddenly rounded, as if he realized who he was, where he was, and what had just almost happened. Do you think we want to go anywhere right now? We're going to my house. It's your home now, too, I answered, 